Uh, it's the headphones. The phones, if they're not, you know, texting while they're walking or the earphones on their ears while they're walking, they're really not paying attention. Honeybees are sort of like the canary in the coal mine for us. They put their health on the background because they're so busy and this wellness program actually allows you to keep your health as a priority. Hello and welcome to University Beat. I'm Denise White. Tampa Bay, it can be a dangerous place for pedestrians or anyone else who shares the road with motor vehicles. In 2014, the Bay Area was percentage-wise the second deadliest region in the nation for pedestrians. And the numbers for 2015 are expected to be even worse. The safety of people who walk, bicycle, or skateboard is a major concern for law enforcement all over, including the officers at USF. When a student was hit in a crosswalk last year, University Police Captain Meg Ross decided to take action. Well, I think back to, to uh, a crash that occurred here at 50th and, and uh, Elm, and uh, I, the student that was uh, struck was uh, very seriously injured, and, and I was out there um, first on scene, um, and, and it makes me think of my daughter. And, uh, you know, the day she goes off to college, um, this is a concern. And I, we want to protect them. And sometimes it means some tough love. Um, education, yes. Uh, a written warning if, if uh, that's what we deem. And sometimes it's a citation. And it's because we really want people to learn that, that safety is of the utmost importance here. Ross applied for a state grant and was awarded more than $14,000. USF police are using the money to print safety pamphlets and to pay officers overtime to educate, issue warnings, and give citations. Ross says one of the biggest problems is cell phones. Uh, it's the headphones. The phones, if they're not, you know, texting while they're walking or the earphones on their ears while they're walking, they're really not paying attention. I mean, literally right here alone, I had to stop, like literally grab the two guys or they would have got hit because they're just steady texting and walking, texting and walking, looking down and not paying attention. Although many students we talked to agree that cell phones are a distraction, they also said drivers on campus need to pay closer attention. We expect the drivers to stop right away and they never do, so that's kind of unsafe for everyone. Cars have been speeding by and they don't even stop for you even though they're supposed to when they see you, but I guess it's hard for them to really notice kids walking across. So I almost actually got hit by a car several weeks ago because even with my cane, people don't stop. And um, it was actually two cars. They saw me, but they didn't decide to stop, and um, I almost got hit. I've had many instances where I've, you know, just kind of longboarded or I'd biked across the uh, across the crosswalk and actually people like they just literally they, they they will hit you they will hit you I've been hit on my bike twice I've been hit on my board twice but at least one student sure who received safe. a ticket while biking admitted that um, he was yeah, being careless yeah. I feel safe because I was pulled over recently on the crosswalk and they pulled me over and gave me a $50 ticket because I was doing a uh, illegal crosswalk so yeah did you deserve it yeah I think I did be aware of your surroundings uh, follow the rules of the road Make sure you're safe before you enter, enter a roadway. The grant money will fund the safety program through May. Two USF administrators who were in Brussels at the time of last week's terror attacks are back home, unharmed, we're happy to report. Chancellor Sandra Stone of the Sarasota Manatee Campus and Amela Malkik, Director of Global Engagement, were in Belgium on university business. We Dr. Stone issued a statement offering like condolences to the bombing victims and thanking those who sent her well wishes. There's another form of attack on the minds of people charged with protecting us. In this case, the attack usually is much more subtle and behind the scenes. Sometimes it's political, sometimes criminal, and sometimes both. It's called cybercrime, and it uses the Internet to hack into government agencies and corporate records. It steals personal information and sometimes holds hostage our hospitals, banks, and other institutions. In 2014, the state created the Florida Center for Cybersecurity. Sri Sriharan is the center's managing director. 
Mr. Sridharam is here today. Welcome to University Beat. Thank you for having me. This is a scary subject for a lot of people, but let's talk about our institutions first before we get to the personal issues of cybersecurity for most homeowners. How pervasive is it in our hospitals, our banks, our government institutions? So I think any, any, any institution in the private industry, whether it's hospitals, financial services sector, manufacturing, et cetera, they have a lot of data. And these da this data can be mined and hacked and breached and monetized. That's what the bad guys are after. So for example, there's a lot of intellectual property theft from companies' databases where they have the blueprint for something that they manufacture, a widget that they manufacture. If you can steal that, then you have the blueprint to how to manufacture it. You don't have to invest in R&D. You go straight to manufacturing and you come out in the market with the widget for a much lesser price and you beat your competition. So there are two types of hacks, intellectual property, personal information. And what we find is predominantly the Chinese go after the intellectual property more than anyone else. The personal information is from the East European countries and Russia and others. So they're going into companies to get people's personal information Absolutely. as well. There is credit card information, there is personal information, then there's electronic medical records information. When they can get a hold of your electronic medical records, they get your age, your social security number, your medical history, and all other related information. So for example, if somebody steals that type of information and knowing your medical history, they can commit Medicare or Medicaid fraud, and they can order things under your name, have the government ship it, collect the money, but by the time the feds catch up to them, they're gone. And now they are committing crime in the hundreds of thousands of dollars to millions of dollars. So an electronic medical record is more valuable to them than just a credit card. And is this pervasive or do we just have several instances? I mean, is this a real crisis, let's say? So the best way I can answer that question is several months ago when we started to see a lot of activity in the electronic medical records breaches, if you will, uh, the cost of an electronic medical record that you can buy from the bad guys used to be about two to three hundred dollars. Lately, that price has come down to about twenty to twenty-five dollars. They have so much that they have already stolen. So it is very pervasive. What are the what are the tools in your toolbox, let's say, to help you um, protect us from cybercrime? So the Florida Center for Cybersecurity was established in statute by the Florida legislature on July 1 of 2014. And our mission was be the national model, be the national leader in cybersecurity. And we classified that into three different strategic areas, education, research, and outreach. When you take a look at how much cyber crimes are prevalent these days, and more and more industries, companies, businesses, they all want cyber professionals to protect them, to protect the data, protect their entire business. Otherwise, they could go out of business. So there's a lot of demand on talent of cyber professionals in the millions of jobs that will be open in the next year to 18 months, and there are not enough cybersecurity trained professionals to fill these jobs. So one of the things that we have undertaken is to work with the academic institutions like USF, like other institutions in the state, is to teach cybersecurity create cyber professionals across all the different dif disciplines of cybersecurity. So that's, what, that's a talent pipeline that we need to fill. So we take that very seriously and we do that. So are we in front of this problem or are we behind it? Are we trying to play catch up? Well, when you say problem, the way I will answer it is this. Today we are very reactive. We are not proactive. Mm -hmm. And we need to get to the proactive stage, but I don't foresee hap that happening for another three to five years at least. So in the meantime, then, consumers have to be proactive. Correct. So the outreach program that we have put together is to create that awareness in the marketplace, be it the common citizens, 55 plus, K through 12, or the private industry, or the uh, different defense agencies. We want to create the awareness in cybersecurity, provide the education and the training, so people, uh, they, on, a, on a daily basis, mm -hmm. They, they, they practice good cyber hygiene. Which is what? Cyber hygiene is, for example, you, people put too much stuff on their Facebook, for example, or on their social media that they use. They speak too much about themselves. They say that, oh, I'm gonna be on vacation, I'll post the pictures. 
it's not very difficult for a thief or a crook to figure out where these people live. And now you're announcing and broadcasting to the world that you're going to be out of the house for two weeks. Mm -hmm. So people speak too much about themselves in the social media, they gotta be careful. There are lots of accounts that have passwords and people use simple passwords to protect themselves. No, I think you need to have complex passwords that the hackers cannot guess that easily. Complex in what way? Complex in the sense the number of characters in the password, the composition of characters and special symbols, uppercase, lowercase, those are the kinds of things. And in fact, in many of the good applications, there's a little sign that will come says password strength. And if you type in your password, it'll tell you how strong the password is. The stronger you make it, the better off you'll be. And we should change the passwords more often? So there are two things. One is we have to change the password periodically. You shouldn't let it... Periodically, be. meaning what, every six months? Uh, even sooner, that, so that, that is what I would advise. Not six months is a little too long. Oh. And not use the same password that you use for your bank accounts as for, for your emails. You advise people not to take part in online surveys and polls. Why? Uh, because you don't know who is conducting that survey and what information is being collected. In most of the surveys, they'll ask you for your name, they'll ask you for some personal information, and people just enter that information not knowing who is really conducting this survey. What kind of trends are you seeing in cybersecurity? Uh, one of the biggest trend, trends that, that we have seen in the past couple of months is ransomware, where they will lock up your file, they will encrypt your file, and you cannot access it unless you pay them the ransom. That's becoming very common. Sounds like we all need to be much more educated about cybersecurity. Educated, vigilant, and alert. Mrs. Rioran, thank you so much for coming in. Something all of us need to think about, because I'll be changing my password quite often. I'm, I'm hoping that all of you will practice good cyber hygiene. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. You're welcome. Much of the food we eat is dependent on some of nature's smallest workers, honeybees. The bees pollinate plants and flowers. But hives across the country are facing a serious threat known as colony collapse. This occurs when bees, sometimes 60 percent of them, mysteriously abandon a hive. In an effort to grow the Bay Area's bee population, USF's Botanical Gardens offers a class on the ancient art of beekeeping. Here in his own words is master beekeeper Brent Wiseman. We begin our beekeeping classes here at the Botanical Garden in November. And we start off with, for the most part, students that are eager to become beekeepers but know nothing about bees and have never looked inside a beehive. So we take them month by month through the steps they need to know. Then, in April, the students get their first colony of bees to take home on their own. Our purpose is for them to be as confident and as comfortable as possible in handling their bees. We don't want them to be afraid of their bees. We don't want them to get their bees home and then never open up the box. And what's gonna happen there, unattended bees tend to be dead bees. So, we're trying to train them to be bee keepers, not bee havers. Honeybees are sort of like the canary in the coal mine for us. They tell us how healthy our environment is. So as we, as we watch the bees and we watch them either flourish or diminish, we are also monitoring sort of inadvertently the health of our environment. We have become dependent on honeybees to pollinate the many fruits and vegetables that we demand on our breakfast and lunch and dinner tables. When you also realize that the honeybees pollinate some of the grains and grasses that livestock feed on that we also eat, then that even widens the chain one, one more step. The average person, the average homeowner can help bees even if they don't want to keep bees by reducing or eliminating the use of pesticides in their yards, by reducing the amount of grass that they grow and replacing those with, with flowering plants that not only honeybees but all of our native pollinators need to, to survive. So creating a bee-friendly environment uh, is within everybody's reach. 
From the health of bees to the health of Bay Area CEOs, many local business leaders are turning to USF to help them stay physically fit. University Beats Hedel Gandhi shows us the Executive Wellness Program. For Jean Marie Milla, a trip to the doctor's office comes complete with her own personal concierge. Okay, so this is how your agenda will look today. She learned about the Mansoor Executive Wellness Center at USF when she moved to Tampa five years ago. Actually, my job took me down here. I worked for um, Verizon for over 35 years, and I had the opportunity to come and be the region president of the Tampa Bay area, so it was a, a great, great opportunity. But being an executive at such a large company is also demanding. Well, as you can imagine, you have, you know, thousands of employees that are working for you and you're trying to um, get involved in the community and drive revenue into the market. So it was a very busy, hectic job, but one that I really, really loved. Jean Marie admits she was so tied up taking care of others, she struggled to find time to take care of herself. And sometimes there are days where you're lucky you even have time to have lunch. Uh, within the course of the day. So you want to also make sure that you're keeping up with your health. You don't want to make that not a priority. And sometimes that happens with executives. They put their health on the background because they're so busy. And this wellness program actually allows you to keep your health as a priority because you can do things all in one day. I'm going to start by listening to your heart so you okay. can just breathe normally. Okay. The program's director, Dr. Denise Edwards, says that one-stop shopping is the perfect fit for busy leaders. Okay. Very highly productive and so oftentimes we're talking about things such as stress management and sleep and issues like that that may not get covered with their traditional doctor just because there's not as much time to talk. It was always, well, you need to go find this doctor and then set yourself up with you know, this whole piece of it. And that doctor, even though they were caring for you, they weren't really looking at you holistically. But at Mansoor, And we're gonna start with your left ear. The goal is comprehensive care. Hearing and vision tests are part of the standard physical. The patient's blood work is collected at their home or office so that it's completed when they arrive. They are checking you from head to toe to make sure that, you know, everything is, is working the way it's supposed to be working. And here at the Executive Wellness Center, all the testing is done on site, everything from mammograms to CT scans, which means patients don't have to wait weeks for results. They can get a diagnosis and all the results while they're waiting. And all of your testing looks fantastic. At that time, I can go through it with them, explain what it means, answer any questions they have about it, and then kind of give advice based on that. We can decide on any medication changes or if they need to change their dosage or start medications or even potentially stop some. Um, and that's nicer from the physician's perspective because otherwise we, we're seeing the results after they leave. And then oftentimes it's one of our nurses calling and so it's not the same level of detail that we get to go into with the patient. For Jean Marie, the choice to come to Monsoor Executive Wellness Center proved to be more than just a time saver, it was a lifesaver. It wasn't until I came here and, you know, based on going a little bit deeper with stress tests, EKG, all of those things that it was picked up that, oh, I have an irregular heartbeat. And even when she needed to see a specialist. I'll make a phone call and say, hey, this is an executive who's in our wellness program. And then what you'll find is they expedite and they make it more of a, a priority to get you in, which you wouldn't have normally. Quick access to 450 specialists who are within the USF network. Just one of the many perks that attracts some of Tampa's most pampered patients, including USF's own top boss, Dr. Judy Genshaft. It was the best. It was phenomenal because you go there and you have a certain amount of time and all the doctors come to you. You don't have to be a CEO to take part of this program, but the cost, which is not covered by insurance, can range from $1,500 to $3,000 per visit. So for me, you can't put a price tag on your health. Now retired, but busier than ever. Still, she finds time to take care of herself, whether it's a trip to the spa or the spa-like wellness center that keeps her healthy and active. For University Beat, I'm Hedel Gandhi. 
It's been a big month for the Kate Tideman College of Business on the USF St. Petersburg campus. First, Sridhar Sundaram was named Dean of the College. Dr. Sundaram most recently was an Associate Dean at Grand Valley State University in Michigan. And then came this announcement. And we're very, 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 very happy to announce today a new $5 million gift from Lynn Pippinger to USF St. Petersburg. And in recognition of this phenomenal generosity, the naming of the new Kate Tiedemann College of Business building as Lynn Pippinger Hall. So, Previously, Ms. Pippinger donated $10 million to the School of Accounting on the Tampa campus. This week in USF history saw the first official open house of the school's new library. The date was April 9, 1961. The $1.7 million building was, and is, one of the defining structures on the Tampa campus. USF put up a valiant effort but fell short in the second round of the NCAA Women's Basketball Tournament. The team advanced by defeating Colorado State in the first round 48-45. to In the next game against UCLA, the Bulls fell behind by 16 points at halftime. And then senior guard Courtney Williams took over, scoring 23 points in the second half for a game total of 29. But it was not enough. The final score was UCLA 72, USF 67. Williams has been named an Associated Press Honorable Mention All-American for the second season in a row. It's also been quite a season for the USF softball team, record-setting as a matter of fact. The team has won 21 games in a row. The streak began after a March 4th loss to Texas State that featured some unbelievable plays by center fielder Julie Weber. First this one. Then this one. Then she did this. That last catch was so good it was featured on ESPN Sports Center as one of its plays of the day. Theater USF is preparing its spring production. It is the 2014 Tony-nominated musical, Violet. The show is about a young woman's quest for beauty in the 1960s. Our Mark Schreiner tells us how the students are bringing to life this story of love and courage. The title character in USF's adaptation of the Broadway musical, Violet, sets off from her North Carolina home with hopes that a televangelist in Oklahoma can heal her. Violet has a scar across her face, the result of a tragic childhood accident involving her father. However, in a testament to the power of acting, there's no scar visible through makeup or prosthesis. The performers have to make the audience believe that it's there. I think a lot of it for me has been thinking about what it would be like to have a scar like that and remembering that that scar is there um, and that this entire journey is about that, really kind of about that scar and um, about the fact that it's ruled her entire life. Setting off on a cross-country bus trip, Violet meets and interacts with a number of people who react to her disfigurement with horror. Oh my goodness. Violet strikes up a more cordial relationship with a pair of soldiers, a white man named Monty and an African-American man nicknamed Flick. Such friendships between races were highly unusual and rarely accepted, in the play setting of the American South in the 1960s. You know, in the present, the things that they say and do are considered okay. Um, but back in his time period, it's not really okay. So I have to watch and I have to react a certain way to different kinds of situations that either him and Monty are in or him and Violet are in. Before rehearsals even began, the play's director, assistant professor of theater, Douglas Hall, set about helping his students realize the complicated era Violet is set in. So I would bring in pictures and newspaper articles. I also would uh, suggest several films that they could watch just to get an idea of what that social time was. While dealing with those changes, Violet flashes back to her past and her complicated relationship with her father. Because uh, I'm a single father in the 60s and I don't like talking about all of these these issues. I don't like being open. Violet was first performed off-Broadway in 1997, a 2014 revival featuring music by renowned theater composer Janine Tesori, writer of the musical Fun Home, netted four Tony nominations. Violet is the first show at USF directed by Hall, 
a veteran performer and teacher of musical theater in New York City. Doug is so great. He's so great letting us find letting us find our own ways. And his right way of working with actors, that really boils it down to what is the most important thing. Hall returns his cast's praise, saying they're capturing something special. It's a meaningful piece that I think the students here are connecting to, which just makes them want to do a great job. And even though Violet is set in the 1960s, its message of going beyond the surface to find the person within is a timeless story that any generation can relate to. The, the political climate we're in right now has sort of brought so much of that back to the surface that I think it can really speak to people today and remind us that we're human beings. Violet is definitely a walk that everyone takes. Um, it's not just about Violet trying to find beauty, it's about her as a human being trying to find out where she belongs. Violet runs April 14th through 17th and 21st through 24th in Theater One on the Tampa campus of USF. For University Beat, I'm Mark Schreiner. If you'd like to contact University Beat, there are several ways to reach us. Our email is ubeat at wusf.org. Our website is universitybeattv.org. We're also on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Just search University Beat TV. And that's University Beat for this week. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Denise White.